Thank you and um, hello everybody. I have the, the honor, the pleasure to be the first speaker in our Emerging Future um, track. Um, and the topic will be about robotics is a very broad topic. We'll have many talks about it today. Um, I will focus on the topic of uh, robots in public spaces. My name is Maria Danninger and I am from Accenture Technology Innovation, where I'm leading our product developments in the area of next-gen robotics. We are a small emerging global team uh, with a hub in Munich, so that's also where I am based and uh, I came from yesterday. I would like to start with a little quiz so that we can all uh, wake up. So um, um, I do this specific quiz uh, for the first time, but I think with the crowd here at Technical University Bratislava, I hope the questions are not all uh, too easy for you. <laughs> the intention is to get uh, a feeling of what is already possible today and what is still a little bit beyond science fiction. So I brought um, seven questions for you today. Um, so the first one is... Um, Robots can be injected into a patient's bloodstream without requiring any surgical intervention, allowing for the administration of treatment. So, um, who of you, maybe I think we don't need uh, Menti or anything like this, uh, not a big crowd, who of you believes that this is already possible today? Maybe just a quick raise of hand. Um, and uh, who believes uh, this is the uh, fiction and will come in the future. Maybe also quick raise in hand. Okay, so I think it's like one third, one third, and one third is probably undecided or still not <laughs> waking up. So actually, um, this is uh, still a fiction, but coming very soon. So such a tiny injectable robot that could be in the future um, be used for treatments, uh, for example, also for brain cancer. There's a lot of research go going on. We call those little robots uh, nanobots or nanorobotics. Um, they actually only have the, the size of a grain of rice. So this is something that we will see very soon, not quite yet. Robots can acquire human tasks through observation, bypassing the need for coding. Who believes this is already possible today? I will not look at my colleagues who are working with this. <laughs> and uh, who believes this is something that will come in the future? Okay, yes, uh, you're very right. So uh, learning by demonstration, imitation learning, no code robotics is something uh, that we already do today. So we don't need to be expert computer programmers anymore, um, but also non-robotic experts can actually train um, robots. I brought one example, for example, our um, Accenture labs. Um, they have demonstrated that a robot can actually learn how to assemble furniture just by studying from a written and video instruction. We utilize drones to deliver life-saving humanitarian resources during crisis. Who believes? That is already, yes, okay, I see many hands and, and of course we are right. And also at Accenture, we are collaborated, for example, with um, Wings for Aid to design such um, cargo drones that can actually do, do just that. Robotic uh, dogs, uh, guard dogs, patrol factories to detect any <laughs> abnormalities or any intruders, people who shouldn't be there. Already possible today? or something for the future? Okay, I, I know, the questions are too easy, you're very good. <laughs> but actually, particularly um, in those very protected and potentially dangerous environments we are seeing, for example, oil and gas platforms, utilities factories, we are actually doing a POC we started, I think last week, um, that we do actually, you can see um, it also in the video, a robotic inspection with one of those robot dogs, um, the, the Boston Dynamics spot is in the video. We used um, uh, a different four leg robot for to do exactly this. Drones are facilitating package deliveries in densely populated areas, ensuring that packages arrive within only a few minutes. 
after being ordered. Already possible? Or maybe not quite yet? Yes, I think uh, both of you are right, because actually it's already technically possible, so drones can actually um, uh, carry loads, but actually due to safety uh, regulations and actually most countries and all the countries we operate in, it's actually not allowed by law to have uh, heavy drones flying around densely populated areas. There are organic robots designed to inspire designed or inspired by biological organisms or processes. Anything you can think of? Or maybe for the future? Okay, a little undecided. It's actually a tricky one. Um, it is um, a fact. I was actually quite amazed when I saw this video for the first time. Um, it's called uh, E-Seed. It's a project uh, that at Accenture we have been funding at MIT, uh, not MIT, sorry, at uh, Carnegie Mellon's um, Morphing Matter Lab. And as far as I know, it's the only innovation um, from our company that made it even on the cover of the Nature Journal. And you can see how new um, biodegradable seed carriers um, are dropped from drones. Um, and then they are drilling themselves more easily into the ground. So it has a huge potential to um, improve effectiveness of aerial seeding. Last but not least, maybe coming back more to our real lives, there is a commercially certified car capable of autonomous driving without any human intervention on the road. Possible, most of you. Uh, Yes, maybe not quite on the road without any uh, driver present. Okay, so a little undecided. Um, actually, if we really look at those five levels of autonomous driving, uh, just last week, um, Mercedes has celebrated that two states in um, the US have approved their level three technology on their roads. However, level three means the robot is in full control, but a human driver still needs to be present in case the system requires. So only from level four, once we'll have the first level four autonomous car on the road, um, a driver, intervention of a driver is not needed anymore. And still only at level five, we can be pure passengers and there will not even be a driver's seat anymore. So you did very, very well. Um, thank you for participating. Um, and now let us uh, leave fiction and concentrate on what is already in the market today, because as um, you could hopefully see, um, there is a very new generation of robots that is already here. And uh, the point of my talk will be that this is the first generation of robots that will serve us humans outside of factory and warehouse environments, outside of industrial contact, in our everyday public spaces. Let's look at the robotics market. I think we all know it. The huge, that's why also many companies are investing in it. Um, the overall global robotics market is actually forecasted to grow each year by approximately 15%, which is quite a huge growth. Um, so um, it is expected to reach over 280 billion US dollars 10 years from now. This growth, of course, includes also all the more traditional robotics uh, tech technologies um, across all industry. And let's not forget how many robotic systems, I just showed this very, very briefly, still look, um, are those robotic machines that we also saw uh, that we are seeing since 50 years in, in factories of car manufacturers. And also those robots are already very useful, even though, of course, they are very far from being flexible or adaptable in any way. But um, of course, also in industrial contexts, robots are becoming more and more intelligent, more and more flexible. Actually, digital engineering and manufacturing is almost a new industry standard. Uh, and in the modern factories, robots are more and more bridging between the physical um, and the virtual worlds. In the videos, you can see examples of what we are doing at Accenture um, in our industry 
practice, which is already established practice that works on client projects. Um, that scale, you can see many AMRs in warehouses. You can see many simulations next to uh, real systems, um, digital trends of factory cells, and so on and so forth. But um, of course, this huge expected growth will then not come alone from such robots in industrial settings. The next generation of robots, as I said, is already there. It will serve us humans outside factories, warehouses, and uh, we actually also call them service robots. I will bring many examples um, in my presentation today. There are benefits. There are uh, many of reduced operational costs, better use of space, not to forget, also very important. Um, increased productivity, the numbers our research team found um, are um, also explaining the growth that we will see. Um, check out the numbers on, on the slide. But now I want to have a quick look at those, um, at, at, at this next generation of robots. They are adopting, as we have seen, very different form factors on the one hand, and levels of artificial intelligence. On the other hand, we are seeing um, AMRs, autonomous uh, mobile robots that are very efficient for transportation of good. We are seeing uh, drones, as we have seen, for aerial inspection and also simple even maintenance tasks for picking an apple, as uh, we have seen in, in the keynote. Um, we have seen here in the middle specialized service robots that are more designed for um, for customer-facing roles, we are seeing those four-legged robots I talked about. Of course, um, robotics arms and cobots that can perform a large variety of tasks. Um, everything from goods picking, all sorts of manipulation, machine tending, and of course, last mile delivery robots. Uh, still quite young, but um, probably also revolutionizing um, e-commerce. This next generation of robots, um, what they have in common, many advanced um, features, like um, they're becoming, of course, more and more intelligent. They are interacting with us humans more intuitively. They have very new sensory abilities, um, thanks to vision, audio, also tactile uh, haptic sensors that all need to come together. Um, increased mobility, also dexterity, very important, because those OL robots will need to navigate their environments autonomously. They need to perform much more complex tasks, um, manipulate objects, collaborate with us humans. Uh, okay, I can talk very long about this, but maybe let's look at, <laughs> let's look, um, at uh, application areas, because um, lastly, all those next generation robotic systems they are applicable to many more industries. Um, we have studied actually all of those industries in more detail, um, but today I want to focus on public spaces. So I want to give a little closer look into the retail and the hospitality industry, because this is where I believe um, all of us will be seeing those new service robots um, in our everyday life. So maybe at this stage, who of you has met, interacted with um, any of such new robotic systems outside of a laboratory, like in real life, maybe in a hotel, maybe in a hospital, maybe in a restaurant, maybe at an airport. Okay, so I think quite uh, some, but maybe just to repeat from the keynote, maybe two years from now, um, I think all of us will have. So checking the time, okay, that looks good. Um, we looked at the retail market in more detail and um, with the largest uh, section, actually half of the retail market is food and beverages. So we see also many examples of robots in supermarkets. And when looking at the market, we found uh, some interesting facts. First of all, the retail industry is constantly growing. You can see here the expected growth. Um, we expect an annual growth rate of four or five percent each year, so it should be quite comfortable for retailers. However, what also surprised us a little bit, this growth doesn't come alone from e-commerce because actually the e-commerce boom is going back and e-commerce is slowing down. 
and customers are actually really starting to return to stores at large numbers, um, even meeting the numbers that we had before the pandemic. And this actually is currently a huge challenge for the retailers because many of, the sto uh, of their stores at the same time have closed during or after the pandemic. You can see some numbers here in 2020 during the pandemic, actually 12,000 stores closed in the US. A year later, 9,000 in Great Britain, some numbers we found. Um, and also after the pandemic, at least, I mean, I even see it in my street, there's a huge labor shortage. Also stores closed just because they can't find the labor to operate the store. In addition, um, they are not only looking at uh, robotic systems in, in order to make the remaining people that still work of the stores more efficient, but also those customers that actually decided to return to stores they have very different expectations nowadays. It's not really the commodity you're shopping so much anymore, um, but they are searching. We found some numbers that 35% of those customers that come in stores, they're searching for an enjoyable shopping experience. They want the experience, not only, I mean, to buy some stuff they can also do online. And in addition, um, we also call it sometimes the, the omni-channel customer. The customer expects that also the different channel supply chains merge so they can see something in a store and maybe because they are too lazy, maybe because their size isn't there, they want to order it and they expect it to be delivered to their home seamlessly without any other interface opening Amazon or anything like that. So as a result, the retail industry is currently undergoing one of its biggest transformations that we have seen to date. Um, and... Uh, I want to present to you today some of the top service robotic trends that we are seeing in retail. Many actually focus on the back end, on the warehouse, all the way to dark stores, 24-7 fulfillment centers, where maybe ultimately not even a single human um, will be needed anymore. That's why they're called dark stores. Let's can be switched off. Um, but uh, in this talk, I want to um, focus on on in-store robots, because I think that is where we will meet those robots in our, in our daily life. Mm -hmm. In-store robots that will operate it in the store of the future, they can either, as I said, enable a better customer experience or make employees more effective or bridge this um, virtual physical gap and um, provide a better supply chain. Finally, uh, <laughs> the, the examples um, that I also uh, promised. Regarding a uh, customer experience, what we are seeing uh, already in the first uh, stores, CM stores uh, in, in San Francisco is um, the one on, on, on the left side, um, are robots that help customers find the goods that they're searching for and lead them through the store. You can see a Lowy bot, it's already a video from 2016. So many of those systems, um, they are not very, very new, but they are already tested and actually really implemented by, by retailers. Another example you can see here in the middle, um, in order to make um, employees more efficient, robots can take over the task of, of keep, keeping track on stock and just finding out what, uh, which of, of the items is, is running out of stock. I think that is one task that we maybe don't want a human uh, staff worker to do, and that can be taken over by a robot. And of course, humanoid looking robots. I mean, the Pepper is maybe not the most novel robot anymore, but it is one of the robots many retailers have uh, tested, experimented with. It always catches uh, people's attention. We have a call, a talk a little later on on the more advanced humanoid robots also here, here in this track. Um, and maybe continuing here, I, maybe. Some of you have heard of uh, Alphabot and the Amazon fulfillment centers that really works. What's this promise of delivering and, and packaging the shopping bag in a very short amount of time? I also like Millie in the middle, which is deployed at uh, Corps in Australia. It's a service robot that can find and detect spills of like milk uh, or whatever falls on the ground, but it cannot only detect, but it can also uh, clean it and wipe it. So it's like a cleaning robot that it can also detect such as this. And last but not least, um, Stockpot, the last video, it's also an inventory, a little more modern inventory robot 
that um, that we can see in the market already. So uh, this was the, the retail industry. The second one I wanted to talk about um, today is hospitality, because um, when we look uh, again at the hospitality market, um, we found, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, first as an introduction with um, hospitality, what we will mainly talk about when we think about robotics is the future of hotels, of restaurants, of airports, that's more the travel accommodation industry. Um, also, of course, many public spaces where those robots will need to operate. Looking at the industry as a whole, it is expected to grow actually a little similar, a little more than the retail industry, a little more than 5% growth rate each year um, for the years to come. However, the robotics technology market growth in this industry is expected to be 25% each year. So five times more than the industry as a whole, um, which actually would show that also robotics is expected to revolutionize this industry also in the coming years. We looked at the, the value chain, the key value chain in the hospitality industry, um, all the way from planning the trip, traveling, checking in at a hotel, checking out again, and uh, thought about uh, the key use cases and points where such service robotic systems will be seen and used um, in already or in the near future. So it all, what we can imagine is already for trip planning, there will be those uh, intelligent uh, chatbots that can uh, support me. Uh, then when, uh, the point is a little difficult here, I think you need to try to follow, I'm studying in the, in the bottom right corner. Um, and then when we actually arrive um, at the hotel, I show you of course some examples on the next slide, we can see um, that the guest reception also can be taken over by AMRs, by robots that can work 24-7, no longer night shift for hotel staff. Um, also the check-in itself, the concierge um, could be a robot system, of course always needing to think where we also want to uh, enable customer in interaction. Facility management, on average, each hotel has 20 um, workers just for cleaning. And I think operating a fleet of robots that can take over cleaning tasks um, is very obvious and we are already seeing in the market today. Also, luggage management, um, of course, can be done by mobile uh, robotic systems that transport heavy suitcases to hotel rooms. Another area is food preparation. We are already seeing robots that can... Um, support preparing food, also barista-style robots that can um, brew a fresh coffee for the customers. And of course, check out is similar to the check-in, a nice humanoid robot of the future. Maybe can um, uh, can replace some of the labor shortage. So let's look uh, again at some real life examples that we have uh, seen with our clients or in the market um, operational already. For example, the, the Hilton hotel chain um, was already in 2016, they experimented with uh, such a Pepper Human Aid robot and how it can attract people at the reception of their hotels. Um, Another example of such a cooking robot, you can see uh, upper in the middle, you can see the UR robot arm that the Flyso Hotel was operating, they called it Chef Bot. So actually the, the customers could bring a, a bowl and prepare the food, pick the vegetables, pick the pasta, hand it over to the Chef Bot, and the Chef Bot would, um, would uh, even cook the noodles, prepare the meal and hand it back to the customer. Uh, at Crown Plaza Hotel, we can see a, a Lucky Bot, a delivery robot that is used um, to, to deliver food to customers. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and such delivery robots actually nowadays can navigate autonomously throughout a hotel. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this in the next five minutes that I have. <laughs> 
but maybe before this also in the in the travel agency at um, Amadeus um, airport uh, operation provider they are also experimenting with humanoid robots um, for for planning trips for their passengers in the middle uh, pizza hut of course restaurants taking orders from customers uh, answering questions um, and even um, doing doing the payment process and the billing is already we see for example at pizza hut in the us um, also operating the first robot store to support support waiters last but not least the travel mate i actually i didn't put the video you should all look it up it's a very different idea uh, travel mate is an autonomous suitcase which is following you so you don't need to actually carry it or push it behind you it's really able to follow you it has of course anti-collision detection can turn around 360 degrees um eliminates the need for carrying like when I saw this, when preparing the talk, I, I, I think I know what I will wish for Christmas. <laughs> I hate carrying suitcase. <laughs> but now in the remaining minutes, I want to focus a little bit more on those uh, service robots delivering goods, because those are the ones that we are actually seeing most commonly. Um, and at Accenture, we are working with... Um, a startup from Munich. There are actually dozens of vendors, uh, Lucky, Bot, Plato. In Munich, we are working with um, a startup that is operating Jeep. That's the robot you can see here um, on the slide. Jeep has actually been designed in order to replace the minibar in hotels. And the startup had a huge boom during the pandemic. Um, so the intention is that you can call the minibar robot to your hotel room. So there's no minibar anymore. If you want a drink and everything should be contactless, and you don't want the previous hotel um, customer, maybe you you don't know what what the other person touched. You can call you can call Jeeves. It automatically navigates to the hotel room. It can operate elevators. It cannot take stairs, right? <laughs> Not quite yet, <laughs> but it can operate elevators. It can open doors, and it comes to your hotel room deliver the goods. Chiefs is already applied also in uh, the University Hospital in Munich for a similar task, because also um, hospitals, they have a huge problems uh, with, the, with the labor shortage. So they're using a Chiefs robot to transport food, medications to patients' rooms, also transportation of um, samples between the laboratory and the OR. Those are all use cases where also such robots are being, being used. In Munich, in our office, uh, we also have one of those chief robots. Here you can see me in the entrance area of our Accenture Munich office. We bought one of those, um, not because we have a labor shortage in our office, but to really, we call it drink our own champagne, not to say eat your own dog food, which... <laughs> it's a different scale. We wanted to actually test how easy it really is to bring one of those delivery robots to our space, to map the environment, to operate our elevators, our doors. Is it really so easy, so straightforward as all the vendors are promising? We will actually do the first real deployment next week. So we are a little excited about that. But how it will work, I can show you a little video, um, is that we will put those... Um, and those little uh, stands with a QR code in our cafeteria area. And then our employees can scan with their mobile phone the QR code to call the robot. And what will happen then? You can see on the video here, the robot will navigate autonomously, of course. Actually, the mapping was quite straightforward. Um, it now, I think also it's an okay speed, nothing that makes me nervous. The robot uh, operates to where it is called from. Um, and then... Uh, the colleagues uh, can get their free, free croissant or drink. Later, we want to integrate and test the, the payment integration. Um, but the intention is that you can then maybe just, you don't need to get up to get your drink, you just call the chief's robot. But of course, we want to also see how our colleagues interact with such a robot and how it works. Yeah, so I think now it's just a video we took uh, very spontaneously yesterday to show you. Yeah, so that's how... So we are also trying to gain to gain experience. So looking at the time, 
Uh, it's time for, for the outlook. <laughs> I hope you got some ideas on what is already possible today and what we will, I think, all of us be um, in the very near future. That robots that uh, operate, maybe just to summarize the main point again, the robots that operate outside um, of industrial context, in our everyday public spaces, they have a new challenge. Because factories, warehouses, they have a huge advantage. They are controlled environments. We can train all the people that will work together with the humans. That is very different once we are having or seeing, implementing, deploying all those new service robots in everyday public spaces. Just imagine the, no, the robot needs to, to engage, interact, maybe with a child, maybe with an elderly person, um, and uh, uh, so, so such robots, they need to not only share our space, share our interfaces. I mean, I actually like this picture. You can see the four legged robot, but it needs a covered arm and somehow try to actually a very difficult task to open a door that was made for humans. So, of course, the doors in the office of the future, factory of the future, hospital of the future, they will be built so that also robots can operate them and robots don't need to share the interfaces that were made for us. Also, I like the picture of the humanoid robot that is driving a car. I don't know whether you saw it in the internet, there are many of those. I mean, that's not the purpose that we build a robot that can do everything a human can do. It's sort of just an intermediate step until also the environment will be based so that up robots can operate it. Yeah, now the, the time is running out, but I think also in the keynote, we, we touched many of those points because of course, for this natural interactions, Gen AI will be a big game changer. And I think in many of the talks that we will see um, in the afternoon by my colleagues, we'll also touch uh, this topic. I put a quick summary. There are um, and quite a few talks in this session, parallel sessions on next gen robotics. So if you want to know more, stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, for a very inspirative uh, speech. And uh, we will take um, the time uh, for the questions. And don't forget, Maria is available. If we don't answer all the questions, you can, of course, meet her. Buy me a coffee, I'll answer any questions. <laughs> okay. No, coffee is free. <laughs> so we have quite a lot of questions, but I think we will stop on the most prominent. So how do we prevent any robot from endangering living beings? What about hackers? That's actually a very good um, question. Um, maybe to give an example from our practical experience, we now had when deploying this delivery robot in our office. Of course, we also need to get um, legal approval. And this is exactly the question that they were asking us. How do you make sure? Also, if something fails with the robot, how do you make sure it doesn't? I mean, just imagine uh, such a hundred kilo robot falling down any stairs because uh, it didn't see the gap. Um, and so we actually needed to fill out questionnaires and there always needs to be some double ground if the one system, uh, maybe the lighter system that against the environment fails, and even the robot was mapped to operate in the environment. Maybe it gets lost, it thinks it is at a different place than it actually is. Um, all those steps we needed to think through, and also the providers actually did, also in order to get the robot certified. So what they, for example, did, um, if the robot is there's any danger that their robot can fall down stairs, they put also, in addition, like a magnet um, on the ground, just to be sure in case all the other technology fails, the robot will never pass. So that uh, look, pass and, and fall down. So um, there are actually many, it's very specific to all those systems, but whenever such systems are deployed, at least in the countries we live in, um, there's a huge process before that we need to ensure. Also with those uh, robot dogs, my, my colleagues know better, when we deploy those four-legged robots, um, we, we have uh, guidelines of how they need to be operated. There always need to be two operators, just in case, uh, to make sure people don't get too close, don't get hurt. Um, but of course, that's a very, very important topic. And um, so I think it's somehow connected. Uh, but what are the challenges, uh, the most significant challenges for the robots face in public space? So it was threat, but what challenges? 
I think um, partly what I already said um, before, the challenge is that it's a public space. It's a space that we cannot control so much. I mean, even our office is more like a semi-public space. We can implement all those um, safety regulations if it is the more really public the space gets, the more difficult it is. And maybe that is also because uh, a reason why we don't see those robots so much yet. For example, um, the, the interaction with, we, we call it untrained humans. But as I said before, those humans can be anybody, can be a person not speaking the language, also very loud in, uh, noise in the environment, any sort of, disability or a spat if you're a child, so the robot needs to interact, be flexible, be adaptable. That is the entire area where we believe that Gen AI will really influence robotics in order to enable a more natural communication, this flexibility, this adaptability, automated decision making. Um, in such a case, when a robot operates, we need, um, we need online decision making. We don't have time to plan to program so those are, I think, the the biggest challenges that we are seeing. Okay, taking into account that you already said, like what robots extension does now, uh, I think it's very important to ask, like the modern technologies are causing that many people like the social interaction. Can this uh, cause negative reaction from society by replacing human with robots? Sure. To miss the social interaction. <laughs> I, I actually believe um, it is a risk. And I think when we also talk about ethical aspects uh, on robotics, on technology in general, um, in the talk by my colleague, my colleague Jenny later in the afternoon, it's, um, it's one of the spaces we really need to be careful with. I have a 12-year-old daughter, and so far I manage she doesn't have a smartphone. It's very difficult, <laughs> but I mean, we really need to be very careful. Um, also with those robots that are becoming more and more human-like, um, that we are not losing our social interactions. And that's why I also, also like this approach of not only looking on how, how can we replace humans in stores, in restaurants, in hotels. I think that is not really the question. The question is really how can we free humans from repetitive, from boring, from dangerous, from dull work that the robot can do better. So that as humans, we can focus on what we can do best, which is the social interactions, the interactions with other humans. I agree. Uh, when do you think robots will be a common sight in public spaces? How will we get there? What will be a common sight in public space where it will be like uh, like normal thing? How do we think robots will be a common sight in public spaces? How we will get there? Okay, so next to all the examples <laughs> I already showed before, I believe I believe actually public spaces next to shops, restaurants, hotels. What we have seen here will be airport. So we even, for example, we got one request from one of our clients who was the, one of the largest airports in the world. They were saying, we want to double the capacity of terminals, but we want, don't want to hire one more human staff. We want to automate. So double the capacity, no more human staff. So I think airports are really also going in this direction. So I think that will be a public space where we will see a lot of robots. Hospitals, of course, as I mentioned very briefly, hospitals are the, the, the future of health and education. I think those are very sensitive areas because it's the elderly, the sick, the children. Um, so I think those are areas where we will also see robots operate. But of course, those areas um, are, we need to really consider even more those ethical responsibility questions and also need more advanced robots that can really handle such kind of interactions. Thank you very much. I think uh, you replied more even than we expected. <laughs> Thank you for 
for being our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you.